Okay, so we're back. We just did a uh, complete to descent for an elliptic curve over a cube. And now we're going to put all that in a, in a vastly abstract way. And the reason why I like doing that example first, because it's very concrete and you see exactly what's happening. You see the elliptic curve, you see the map into some space all of the spaces, which are these homogeneous spaces, and then we're looking for points in the spaces. And whenever we find a point in a space, we bring it back to the elliptic curve. Now, let me go back to that chart. So what we did was looking for, we had these pairs of, of these spaces that are parametrized by these B1, B2 pairs, right? These parametrize a uh, number of spaces that if you see, because there is a map going down from the uh, space down to E, right? Every time we find a point, we have a, a way to come up with a point on the elliptic curve. So these are sort of like covering spaces of my elliptic curve. And what the complete descent told us is that every point on the elliptic curve actually comes from one of these spaces. So they are here, we just need to find them. And what we did is, we do not know how to find points over the rational numbers for such a thing, but we know how to do things over the uh, local fields, over the completions of the rational. So we know how to find points over the reals. We have um, tools to find points over the five addicts. And we were able to uh, block entire parts because there is no local solutions and therefore there is no Q solutions because Q is containing this completion or we were lucky, uh, lucky that for some spaces where if you were first trying to find local solutions, so in, in this space in particular, if you were trying to find local solutions, you would find that there is no problem over the reals, there is no problem over the two addicts, there is no problem over the five addicts, and then you might think like, well, there is points over every completion so there must be a rational point somewhere. And you start looking and you find it. But what if you're not that lucky and you find a space where there are points over every completion, but I can't find a rational point? Should there be one? Well, it turns out that if it was just one equation and it's a quadratic equation like that, and there are points over every completion of Q, then there is a theorem, the hasem minkowski theorem, which is the local to global principle for quadratic forms that tells me that there must be a rational point, okay? If it was just one equation, but here we have two, a pair of equations, and it turns out that the global to global principle breaks. So in some cases, we are going to run into massive trouble. We're going to find spots in our tables of pairs. We're going to find homogeneous spaces where there are solutions for every piatic completion, but there are actually no solutions over the rational. And the problem is we cannot tell those apart. We cannot tell apart the ones where there are rational points and with the, the point or the spaces where there are no rational points. And that's going to be um, some of the the large problem that we're going to encounter. There is one conjectural solution to that conundrum, which is the finiteness of Sha. So, but in any case, uh, what we're going to call is these spaces where there are solutions for every uh, chaotic or real completion, those are going to be called the Selmer group. So in green here is the Selmer group, uh, the two Selmer group for this elliptic curve and spaces where there are piatic solutions or um, local solutions everywhere, but no uh, rational solutions. Those are going to be representatives of what we're going to call SHA, which is the obstruction to the local to global principle. Okay, so let's try to define what is uh, Selmer and what's SHA more formally. Okay, so now remember that from uh, Galois cohomology, again, if you haven't uh, stop here and go back and watch the videos on uh, from Galois cohomology. So from group cohomology, uh, we have that whenever I have a short exact sequence, 
of, in this case, of Galois modules. Now, I have a long exact sequence in cohomology, uh, which goes as follows. It goes uh, first the H naughts, which are just the, uh, the invariants, the sub modules that are invariant under the action of Galois. And then there is this delta uh, connecting um, map to H1s. Okay. So why, why is this relevant to us? What happened before was exactly what we did before is in its cohomology in disguise. It's one of these in disguise. Um, what we did before is the following. So we considered essentially we had the map multiplication by M you see that this is a short exact sequence of Galois modules. The cardinal of multiplication by M is the M torsion. And uh, this gives me a long exact sequence in cohomology uh, that is given by, well, uh, the invariance. So whatever M torsion is defined over K, the invariant of the Galois uh, action on E here, E, means E over K bar. So the invariance is the actual K point. So E K, E K. And then it goes into uh, cohomology through Delta into the H1 of G K E M into H1 of uh, G K uh, E and H1 GKE, where this map is induced by multiplication by M, okay? But you see now I can actually extract a short exact sequence by concentrating on, uh, on this map here. So this map delta is the key um for what i want and so so this map delta what is the um what is the kernel of this map the kernel because this is an exact sequence in cohomology this whole thing is exact the kernel of this map is the image of this map uh the map here is still multiplication by m so first of all i have a an injection of EK modulo MEK uh, is still induced by delta into H1 of GK EM. And I can actually compute what is the, uh, the co-kernel of that map because, uh, well, what is, what is in the next step? What is the image of, um, of this map? Well, the, the image of delta is the kernel of the next one. So, um, or, or rather in here, the image of this one is the kernel of this one. The kernel of the multiplication by M will be the M torsion of this one. So then what I get is that if I map into the kernel, or into the kernel of the next one, then I'm mapping it to the image of the previous one and I get an exact sequence, okay? And where I know where the map is here, that is the Kummer connecting homomorphism between cohomology groups, and that is from cohomology uh, apparatus that is defined by uh, P is sent to the co, uh, the co-cycle, the co-cycle 
that goes from GK to EM such that sigma is mapped to Q sigma or sigma acting on Q minus Q where M times Q is P. Okay. All right. So this is an injection of EK mod M into H1. Okay. And if uh, I have not assumed yet that the M torsion was defined over K, and if EM is defined over K, then uh, the action on the Galois action on the M torsion is trivial. And what I get is actually an injection into the homs of GK EM. Okay, that sends uh, P to kappa of P dot, which is the Coomer pairing. All right. So what we're trying to do is bring this down, bring this back to what we've just done. So how do you use this to compute, for example, the weak model of a theorem, just to prove that E mod M is, um, is finite. For example, what we're going to do is prove that the image of Delta lands on uh, co-cycles that are unramified outside S. And that this is, a, this is an infinite group right here. However, um, when we cut it to uh, co-cycles that are unramified outside S, it lands into a finite part of, of, of this. Okay, and then what we're going to do, this is the part uh, H1 of G and 2E, these co-cycles we're going to actually identify with homogeneous spaces. So the homogeneous spaces we just saw are actually living here. And we're going to see that uh, we can interpret the homogeneous spaces that are global, locally solvable everywhere are going to be living here. Uh, so we're going to be able to interpret every element in here as an element in here and then uh, do the descent in a, in a glorified sense. Okay, but before I do that, let me, let me generalize this a little bit more. We're going to, uh, so more generally, the role of the exact sequence uh, that went, uh, the exact sequence for the two, for the M torsion, that can be generalized if I have an isogeny in general. So suppose because you see for this to work, uh, for this map to work, what we had to assume was kind of strong. We had to assume that the full M torsion was defined over K. That is a little bit strong. So we can actually weaken that a little bit by assuming that what we have in an isogeny instead of a full multiplication by M is an isogeny, but we can come up with other isogenies that will be a little less restrictive uh, later on. So suppose E and E prime are isogenous uh, over K. And uh, so we have an isogeny phi from E to E prime that is defined over K. And, uh, and then we have a dual isogeny and M, uh, so if, um, if phi is of degree M, then the composition of phi and a dual is multiplication by M. Then we have a short exact sequence given by this isogeny E to E prime will have a kernel, which is whatever the kernel is for phi. And because the isogeny is a non-constant isogeny, um, so whenever I say isogenous, it's not the map that sends everything to zero in E prime, there is an actual degree. And therefore 
it's non-constant, so it's rejective. So I get a map like that. All right. Then uh, throw um, throw cohomology to it. And what I get now is a long exact sequence in cohomology. Uh, still, this is from phi, and I get a, my connecting palm to H1s. And this is also induced by phi. And um, as before, I can extract an exact sequence by looking at that delta. So delta gives me a map to H1 of Galois acting on the phi kernel. And in here is going to be E prime K modulo the uh, image. So phi of EK, so that is the kernel. And on the other hand, the image of uh, the image of this map here has to be the kernel of the next one. So I can cut it into an exact sequence by writing GKE phi here. If you replace phi with multiplication by M, then you get the exact sequence we had before. Okay. And again, we are going to identify later on uh, those are going to be identified with homogeneous spaces, but we're going to cut. We're going to have to cut this a little bit in a moment by um, just proving that the image of delta lands on uh, isod um, code cycles that are trivial on on inertia groups that are outside of S, which is meaning that is unramified outside of S. All right, but. Um, now we work also also work locally. We're going to try to bring in uh, the solutions that are local in some way. So now fix a a place okay, infinite or finite of or finite. We've seen that it was helpful to find to look at solutions over uh, an infinite completion of Q over the reals or a finite completion of Q over Q5, okay? So we have um, a place, we have that, then we have a completion, we have the new attic completion of K and K sits in there, okay, inside, um, yeah, it sits in there and um, we also have then that uh, K, we can fix an embedding and it says it's uh, the algebraic closure and we're going to call G nu is going to be the absolute Galois group of the completion. Okay. Then you can, uh, you can think of G nu as sitting as a subgroup of our absolute Galois group, it is in fact isomorphic to a decomposition group at nu. So the largest decomposition group at nu. So if you have a finite extension, you have decompositions. A finite Galois extension, you have the decomposition group. But but for a prime a p, say, um, and you can think of it uh, as the decomposition group at a place. Okay, and. <clears throat> So, yeah, so as a decomposition group. At new. Great. Uh, we also have that um, E, once we fix an embedding, then we can extend the points over K bar are sitting over the points over the, the closure of the completion. 
and uh, Ginyu acts on 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 those points. Then we have a new action on on points. So we have like above, like everything that we've done above. But now consider all the elliptic curves over a completion k nu. So we get a new exact sequence like this, but over each completion at every new. Okay. So uh, so we also obtain with the same mechanism, we obtain an exact sequence of neuotic solutions to our elliptic curve that goes like exactly like before, but now I'm replacing Galois by the, the Galois group, the absolute Galois group in the completion, and I'm replacing uh, the points over K by uh, by new attic points. Okay. But now the fact that uh, G nu sits on G K and that E over K sits in E K nu um, gives restriction maps in cohomology. Okay, so if you follow the video on cohomology, there is this restriction maps and there is inflation maps. In this case, G nu is a subgroup of our absolute Galois group, so we get a, a restriction map from um, from one cohomology group to the next. And what we actually get is the following maps, which is now um, quite amazing in terms of cohomology. So what I have is zero goes to E prime K. Uh, so first the global sequence in cohomology. This is, by the way, what I am interested in is uh, the top row, right? Um, I'm interested in that row, but I get a map down to, uh, because uh, the points over K are, uh, are contained in the points over the completion, I get a map here. And in cohomology, I get a restriction map in cohomology to H1 G nu E phi, and I get a restriction map in cohomology to E, uh, and the, um, that is the the phi uh, kernel, right? And uh, and this exact there's an exact sequence at the bottom, but notice that I get one for every completion. So I'm actually going to do something crazy here and is uh, do the product of all these over all completions. Okay. And what I get is an exact sequence of all those products and uh, these uh, commute. Okay. All right. So, what I'm interested in is in the image of delta. Okay, our goal here is compute uh, the image of delta. Uh, where is the image of delta? The image of delta is uh, because the top row is exact is the kernel of the map that goes from H1 G K E phi to H1 G K E phi kernel, 
right? But that uh, that kernel is contained in the kernel of the one down below, um, because uh, you see this is, so if this, um, because this commutes, if this image here maps to M, every image here is in the kernel of this one, if I go from here to here, everything that maps, um, um, how to say, so, So well, let, let me let me say that this is I claim that this is contained in the kernel of H1 GK E phi down to uh, the product of the uh, H1 GK E uh, phi is. Uh, oh, sorry, the product over G new. Like that. Okay. Um, so, so why? Um, <clears throat> so, if something is in the, um, so if something is in the kernel, so it's in the image of delta, then it's in the kernel of this map. But if I go from here to here, then it's the same as I go from here to here. So anything that lands from here and then I bring it here is as if it comes from here, but everything that comes from here is in the image of this map. So everything that comes this way is also in the image of this map, which is in the kernel of the next one. So if you are coming from here, from here, then you have to also be in the kernel of this one, and therefore, um, therefore, it is inside the kernel of this map here. Okay, so the key point, though, is that the kernels of um, of these kernels, so the kernel of these maps are effectively computable because now these maps are all um, local and I can actually work locally and find what the kernel of that map is, okay? Um, right, so what we're going to define is the Selmer group or the Phi Selmer group of EK um, is the subgroup of H1 GK E phi given by um, S phi EK is the kernel of H1 GK E phi to the product over places of H1 G nu E. Okay. And um, Sha, the phi Sha is, or Sha in general, is going to be the kernel of H1 GKE to the product of H1 G nu of E. And this is called uh, the, the tate shevrevich group. Okay, so um, what we're going to do next time is um, identify, we're going to identify uh, this space to be a space of homogeneous spaces. 
and uh, Solmer is going to be those that is going to be identified with all the homogeneous spaces such that they are locally solvable everywhere. And then SHA is going to be those homogeneous spaces that are locally solvable everywhere, but do not come from rational points. So homogeneous spaces that are locally solvable everywhere, but do not have global solutions. Okay. So we're going to show that uh, Selmer and SHA fit in an exact sequence and that the um, these group uh, embeds into the Selmer and then the uh, the the co-kernel is Sha, and uh, and then try to see how one can compute in some particular cases how can compute elements of Solmer and Sha and show that some elements are in Solmer but not in Sha or some elements are actually in Sha using higher descents. We're going to do some things like, for example, uh, we can use an, yet another tower of of maps in that you can do isogeny say multiplication by two but also multiplication by four multiplication by eight and each one of you those is going to give you more and more information about higher torsion uh, elements in sha for example but if sha was finite one of those sequences is going to terminate and then you're going to be able to compute the 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 sequence at the top and from there compute all the other sequences at the bottom However, we do not know that Shai is finite, and therefore that um, that is some sort of pipe dream that um, in general it works um, because everything we've computed uh, until today, we've seen uh, finite Shas. But um, but it could be that Shai is infinite for some group and then descent wouldn't work. All right, so next time I will um, finish with one more lecture just about uh, this in a little bit, um, prove a couple things about Selmer, prove that the Selmer group is finite, and that, um, uh, and then, um, uh, and then do uh, an example of all this, a concrete example using this to do descent via, uh, via two isogeny. All right, so I'll stop there.